Okay, so gentlemen, uh, let's uh, begin with a prayer. Right. Nomini Patris, the Filius, Virtus Sancta Men, come Holy Ghost, and for the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love, and for thy spirit, and they shall be created. I'm going to pray, O God, and instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant by the gift of the same Spirit, and be always truly wise, and rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. The Lady of Mount Carmel, St. Ignatius, St. Pius X, and Padre Sipiris Vidya Sancti. Amen. Okay, so so much, gentlemen, for coming. Uh, so it's been a long time since we've been able to have a meeting of the Militia Immaculate Brotherhood, so it's kind of uh, suffering. It's due to my fault, of course, and I uh, can blame everything in the world on COVID, but we're very busy. But we can't neglect this very important apostolate of uh, Catholic action through men, men who are really being trained to be soldiers of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we've seen uh, a sort of con a consecration of Russia recently, and of course for 105 years now, people have been praying for the consecration of Russia, and we know that Our Lady promised and said that uh, Russia would spread her errors throughout the whole world. So this conference and the following ones and some of the work that I think some of our men will ask some of our men to do in the Militia Makulati will be dedicated to Our Lady to understand the errors of Russia. Uh, for example, here among our own men, I've asked a couple of our men in Butuan, they're joining us, I think they're joining us, uh, in, the, in, the, in the internet world, the gentleman from Butuan, uh, Salve, um, Salvete. Uh, well, they will be um, you know, working on a topic, let's say, the history of communism in the Philippines. They'll do a little topic. And what we'll try to do and when we have men cooperating is the men do a, little do a little topic and do it on Microsoft Team for a small group, and then I will review it and see if it's okay. And then we'll put it in our little library, some kind of Google share file library where we can begin to work to study, to study the Catholic social teaching of the church under the direction of the priest. All right the idea. So our, top, our, our, our conference here, I don't know if we can get through the whole thing, uh, but it's inspired by the encyclical of uh, Pope Pius XI in 1937, Divini Redemptoris, on communism. Uh, but we can't go over detail. The encyclical is about 83 paragraphs long. And so uh, eventually I'll give you an outline of the encyclical. I've already finished half, almost one, about one third of it uh, with, a, with, say, an outline with a summary of each paragraph. But when I finish this, then I'll give you a copy. I'll give you this copy now so you can begin to study. This is the first 30 paragraphs. Okay. Where, and so I'll just give you a copy after this, a copy that you can begin to study and do your own reading, of course. Uh, the topic, our conference will be, this will be the outline of the conference. What is communism? Okay. And then where does communism come from? And then uh, what are the core errors? The key errors of communism is laid out by the popes. And then, uh, what, where does communism lead to? And then finally, what remedies are proposed by the church? One of the remedies is what we're doing right now, simply to learn Catholic social teaching in order to apply it at every level of society. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a gigantic work. But if we look to Our Lady, the Blessed Virgin Mary, really the idea is to apply it at every, every aspect of society, but... What aspect do we have control over? Our families. What aspect is being destroyed? The very foundation of, of, the, of the world is being destroyed by the family is being totally destroyed. Yeah. So let's come back then to our first question. Uh, what is communism? And firstly, what does the word mean? Uh, communism simply means community. It's kind of an idealistic idea that we should own and share everything in common. Okay. So it means that the, the community, it means the idea, idealistic communism means that the community should own the property people need or that people should own it in common. And uh, communism exists in the Catholic Church called monks. They live in community and they share everything in common. Right? That's the communism. Right? Uh, but this, is, uh, this word is so closely associated with the word, with the idea of socialism which means that society should own the means of production. Um, the society should own the means of production and control everything that is beyond the strictly individual resources. So if you own your own shirt and your own shoes and maybe, maybe even your own house and your own little garden, everything that's regarding you personally, you can own. 
but anything that's going to be productive and, and uh, for a larger amount of people beyond your own family, that should belong to society. That's socialism. That society should control all the means of production, and society could control uh, all of the uh, means of production, the means of exchange, the means of communications, everything beyond the pale of an individual the society should own. That's, that's, uh, so, that's what uh, socialism, the word will mean. Now, so the word communism community. What is socialism all right. as an ideology? Socialism is the, ide the ideology that holds that private property is the cause of inequality in society. People are unequal because of what they have. So it's a materialistic view. If you have more, then you're a better. You're going to be a better person, higher. And if you have less, then you're going to be a lower person, be lower. All right. So this inequality in society makes some people unhappy. In fact, it makes a majority unhappy, and only a few can be truly happy because only a few can have all of the stuff that they want. And so the problem with society is the inequality of uh, property. And when we look at society in general. We see that the workers, they only get a little bit, and the owners, they get a lot. And so the problem of society is that owners, they have everything that they want, and the, the poor workers, they don't have much. And so this is uh, the evil of society. And so we must somehow figure out a way to balance this out, to make everybody equal. And that means we're going to have to transfer ownership from those wealthy owners and give it to society. And then society will make sure that everybody has an equal share. So that everybody can be happy and peaceful. That's the idea of socialism. All right? Now, uh, there's all kinds of different types of socialism, how to go about it, because when you get down into the practicalities of things, it gets to be how do you do it is another story. Now, what is class warfare? All right? uh, according to the socialist, class warfare is an in inevitable result. When there's an inequality, there's an injustice, then one class is going to rise up and revolt against the other then that one will become oppressed. Then that one will get to a point where they can't take it anymore, and these power become, and they will rise up and oppress. It's almost an evolutionary idea, and a binary idea, that it, matter flows by one thing and then the opposite. The water hits the beach, and then the beach gives way, and then the beach comes into the water, and there's a back and forth of all material things. There's a force and a reaction. And so they look at human beings, society, materialistic view, and there's a necessarily this, this uh, the class of owners versus the class of workers. And there's going to be a, a dialectic between these two classes. And so class warfare is an inevitable result of the economic situation. There has to be class warfare. Okay. Now communism, what is communism then uh, as an ideology? Communism, today we always almost always refer to it, and the Pope focused on the communism of Russia. Bolshevik communism, the communism of Russia. This communism uh, meant that uh, it's an extreme form, of mo the most logical form of socialism, and the most extreme form. Uh, the communists did not want to follow the soft socialists who figured that they could create a new society based on politics, based on convincing people, based on soft methods. They figured the only way you can get to the real classless society where everything is balanced out and, and uh, everything comes to this happy utopia of material sharing, material happiness, is by violent revolution. And the communists will be those people who understand this and are going to be the active agents to, to, manip, to, to, to foster that class warfare to create a classless society so that there's only happiness on earth. Right? So... Communism, as Pope Pius XI said in his, one of his great encyclicals, communism teaches and pursues a twofold aim. Twofold aim. Merciless class warfare and complete abolition of private ownership. And this it does not in secret and by hidden methods, but openly, frankly, but frankly and by every means, even the most violent. So you have those two ideas, class warfare and private property, and we've got to We've got to make use of class warfare to destroy private property, to bring about a government that's going to balance everything until we don't need the government anymore and everybody lives in perfect equality in a communist paradise. All right. So that's uh, communism. Uh, communism, you see, is 
a little bit distinguished from socialism, that communism, Bolshevik communism means it has to be done by violence. All right. That was Lenin. That's what he said. It's kind of, kind of, he kind of differed from Marx in that respect, that Lenin figured, you know, you, you're going to get things done. It's, it's like Rambo. Did you ever see Rambo? One day Rambo is in a in Rambo movies, Rambo 1, Rambo 2, Rambo 3, Rambo 4. In one of the Rambo movies, Rambo has been hired to be a bodyguard or something for these missionaries, these Protestant missionaries going into South, uh, South America. And he says, what are you doing? And, and the missionaries say, well, we're going to come and, and we're going to teach people and we're, we're going to make them all better. We're going to change things for the better. And Rambo says, you got any weapons? And they said, well, no. You're not going to change anything. Unless you kill people, you're not going to change anything. And that's, that's a Rambo, and uh, that's, a, that's a soldier, and that's people that know real life. It's almost, it often can be the case. Unless you break some heads, you're not going to change anything. And that's what, that's what communism said in, the, 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 in its early stages. Okay. Right. So that's uh, what communism is. Class warfare, destroy private property uh, to bring about this... Uh, the new world order, all right? The new world order. All right? This key, always remember that when sometimes communism can be confusing because it, const it, it changes its tactics. You know, in 1917, its tactics were pure and absolute revolution and, and fight and bloodshed. After that time, in the 30s and 40s, it began to change its tactics somewhat, all right? And in our day, there's certainly a big tactics change. Now, the second question is, where does communism come from? And so that's a long question. The Pope say that you could never have communism if you did not have a dissolution of Christendom. If Christendom had not disappeared, practically disappeared, there would, communism would never have had a chance. It would never have had a chance. So we needed something bad to happen to society, people to be in such terrible straits that communism could look very good to them. That's what happened. So how did this happen? Well, in the first case, we have 1517, the Protestant Revolt. All right. All right. So communism builds on a, on a long past of revolution. And we saw that already. 1917, Our Lady chose a good date. 1917, 1717, 1517, three sorts of revolution. So 19, 15, uh, you know, 1517 is the first and most remote, remote revolution. That's the Protestant Revolt of Martin Luther. So Martin Luther revolted. And, and, and this was a revolt of the spiritual order, a strictly, entirely spiritual revolt. It took place in the soul. And it was entirely spiritual. I mean, it, obviously it had all kinds of, there were armies, there was, there was uh, slaughters, there was battles. But the whole thing was a spiritual idea. It wasn't a battle over economics. It wasn't a battle over NATO. It was a battle over spiritual ideas. They were fighting for the faith. They were not fighting for borders. They were not fighting for equality of wages. They were not fighting because they had no, they were not having enough food. They were fighting over strictly spiritual ideas. And those, the three basic ideas of Luther, upon he was going to, the, 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 the Protestant revolt destroyed the spiritual basis of the entire Christian order. And when we say entire Christian order, that means politics, economy, culture, sacraments, and church. The whole thing was undermined by the Protestant revolt. And the Protestant revolt, as you know, uh, took place. In, uh, yeah. it, it's also important when we're thinking about communism. We don't often, when we think of Protestantism, we don't think, we think just of Protestant. We think of sola scriptura, uh, of scripture alone, private interpretation, uh, just, uh, rejecting the priesthood, the Mary, and the, and the saints. We, we don't think about the economic res consequences of Protestantism. And we don't think about uh, what happened in the, in the social order. That everything, that, that, that the fabric of society was ripped to pieces. That the poor man today, uh, what does he have? Well, what did the poor man have in the time of Christ? There was a guild. There was a guild, and they had workers' guilds, and they had a whole organization, they had their processions, they had their fiestas, they had a system of social aid coming from a bond of brothers in a working trade of a certain area. It was a very holistic, a very church 
and society that were together. Church and society were not separate. They were one web. And in that web, there's a whole hierarchy of organizations and a system of mutual aid that was in a hierarchical structure with God and the state and the boss and everybody put together in a hierarchical structure that was not a warfare. That was nothing to do with class warfare, but a natural family welding together of families, put together with states, put together with nations, put together with guilds, put together with monasteries. It was always a tremendous network that we can't hardly appreciate. And when, when the Protestant Revolution happened, that network was, was burst. And it's that bursting of that network that created the need for another form of network, that created the need for another thing that created the New World Order. The dream of the New World Order is built on the very simple thing of destroying the old world order. The old world order was Christendom. And it's a very, a very interlocking order. Church and state, pope, priest, and governors, and armies, and everything working together in a, an entire social fabric that was planted like a tree in the soil of each nation. And every tree was a little bit different because every nation was different. But the life in all of those trees was the same life. There was a great diversity, there was a great many diverse cultures, diverse applications, but all with one spirit, one faith, and one idea of one order called Christendom. And that idea of Christendom never left the world. It took about 100, 200 years. When they were fighting the great wars of religion, Protestants against Catholics, they all thought they were fighting for one world order. They had a conception of one th things should be one way. My way, your way the Catholic way, the Protestant way, but they all knew it had to be one way. They had this idea of one complete Christendom. It was in their blood and in their mentality for about 600 years. It was just part of mentality. People could not think any other way. And it took 100, 200 years and very, very laborious, scholarly, revolutionary, subversive work to blow that idea sky high. And the first thing that blew that idea sky high was the Protestant Reformation. And, uh, the, you know, the Protestant Revolt was built on the three basic things. You know, the Bible alone. We only need the Bible, the Word of God alone. So they take the church magisterium and kick it out. The infallible church magisterium. The one thing about the church magisterium is that it's protected by Christ to teach the truth. And when it speaks of dogma, it's protected by the Holy Spirit to be infallible. That was just taken out of the picture, taken out of the picture of society, or out of the network of society, pushed to the side. And then you have the Bible alone, which doesn't interpret itself. So now everybody makes up his own idea. And then after we have everybody make up his own idea, we have the idea of faith alone. You only need the faith. You don't need good works. So now, now your Bible alone idea doesn't have to fit into your guild. It doesn't have to fit into your work. It doesn't have to fit into your business. It doesn't have to fit into your politics. All that stuff is its own logic. It's got its own science behind it. You just need to believe and you're saved. You don't have to have everything work together. So faith without works meant that you didn't have to have any kind. Your faith needed to have no impact on society and vice versa. And then finally, grace alone. I mean, we don't need sacraments. So now, there's no physical element of Christ and the church working physically, sacramentally in society. That's out. And now society that is built with all the cultures of Europe and, and, and even the Philippines and so on now become, if it, if it adopts the Protestant idea, becomes an empty shell. An empty shell without any inside. So that's the, that's the first thing is that we have this Protestant revolt which you might say creates in people's minds, you know, we have this mind here who sees the world. And now we've destroyed that idea of the Catholic worldview. We just have faith alone. There's just Him and God. Faith only. But now, how do you organize your world? This is a personal relationship here. It's just me and God. It's got no social ramifications. So now, how do I organize this? And that's where we simply have a, a many men like Francis Bacon and so on, Isaac Newton and all these great scientists, uh, these great men that are the makers of the modern mind, 
are talking about a new world order. Francis Bacon, he lived in the 1600s, he wrote a book called The Novum Organum. It's not new world order, but it means the same thing. I don't know, that book came out in 1660s or something like that. The Novum Organum, it means the new organic whole. And the first part of the book was called Pars Destruens, which means the destructive, the negative destroying part. And the second part was called Pars Informans, or the building part. And in the destroying part, he just attacked St. Thomas Aquinas, theology, the, all of the Catholic ideas. He attacked them all. Then in the Pars Informans, he began to build a new world order based on empirical science alone. In other words, philosophy and theology are out. We're going to build on science, on, on hardcore, hard facts, empirical science, and we're going to build this new world order on that. And so you have this effort to build a new world order. And, and, our Catholic, and for our Catholic men and for ourselves, this basic idea has, is, is rationalism. Rationalism is the, idea that one, is the idea that man's reason can figure everything out. Man's reason is the source and judge of all truth. How can you say that? Because there's no revelation. We've rejected revelation. God is the source and end of all truth. But we've taken God out of the picture. And now we have nothing left but our reason. And the problem is that, yes, our reason is the guide of our life, but above our reason is God. But they've taken God away. So there's no higher guide than reason. Rationalism is precisely the error that says there's no higher guide to man than his reason. And so there was many uh, interesting movements and so on about this time. You know, Isaac Newton, mathematics is growing, all these science, uh, Galileo and so on. So this rationalistic movement, all right? All right, And then, after that, of course, you have about 200 years going by. After the Protestant Revolt, things have to settle down. In the 1600s, the 1500s is the Protestant Revolt. The 1600s, the growth of rationalism. And then, we want to interpret that and put rationalism into practice in the political sphere. That is liberalism. There are many secret societies formed for liberalism in view, but for them, liberalism was not what it is today. Liberalism was to break the shackles of the Catholic Church, to destroy the shackles of the kings. Uh, one of the French uh, writers of the 1760s, he was an encyclopedist. In fact, the encyclopedia, the whole idea of an encyclopedia is a rationalist concept. Uh, an encyclopedia means you know everything. It's all in there. Just what do you need to know? I need to know Abaca. What's that? Look it up in your encyclopedia, Abaca. You got the information. In the Catholic world, you could never do that. There's no such thing as learning what a vodka is if you don't know what trees are, and you don't know what agriculture is, and you know what plants are, you don't know where they came from, and you know what their purpose is. In other words, if you didn't have a complete education, there's no point in you having an encyclopedia. You see, you need to have a university. The idea of education in Catholic times was university. University means everything that you know. Arithmetic, astronomy, mathematics, a little biology. You know a little bit of everything in theology. And it all must come together. If you don't have a little bit of all the knowledge, you have no business teaching, so to speak. You have to have a little bit of everything in your head. Uh, the encyclopedia said, we're going to attack the church by encyclopedias. And so it just may come up with all kinds of uh, facts, especially facts you could use against the church. In the early encyclopedias, they would come up with any facts, scandals, or anything they could devise, all kinds of facts they could use to attack that university idea, that idea that the church has the answer to man's great questions to solve and answer them. And so you had the movement of the encyclopedists, and they were called the encyclopedists who came after the 1717 Freemasons were Freemasons. And one of the encyclopedists, he said this, he, he wrote a poem. He said, we will strangle the last king with the entrails of the last priest. So the image is we're going to take the last priest, kill him, cut open his entrails, and fill the mouth of the last king with the entrails of the last priest. And that is actually a reference to satanic murder. So 
Satanic murder is just that. It's, it's cutting out the entrails of the victim and putting it in his own mouth. It's a satanic murder. So there's a reference of satanic murder, but the idea is that the priest is the hierarchy in the spiritual domain and the, and the, and the king is the hierarchy in the civil domain, and both of them come from God, and we're in a war against God. Well, they don't say that. We're in a war against the church. Right. So... Uh, Freemasonry is uh, in 1717 is a sort of a coalition of all these formerly secret societies into another secret society with a world view to create a new world order. Freemasonry's goal is to create a new world order based on liberty, fraternity, and equality. And so that, that takes place. Now, simultaneously to this movement here, and this is all in the spiritual and speculative and philosophical domain, in the physical domain, we have uh, the rise of the Industrial Revolution, where we have the change from uh, indus cottage industry, people working with their own hands, creating their own tools, people working under a master and an apprentice, to people working in a factory, and everything being produced by machines. And simultaneously, with people working in a factory and everything done by machines, you have to have another independent apparatus to make this one possible, and that's the grand financiers, the big banks, and big money. With this cottage industry, you just need what you need to do your industry and so on. You don't need big funds, but in a, in a, in a big factory business, you need to keep making more profits, and you need more capital to make more engines, and so it's a different whole perspective. And so in the Industrial Revolution, we've got this move to machinery, and financiers and big capital. And, and the way the early revolutions were all, all done was always you had the big financiers secretly funding these armies and these people to get these things done. And so we have the rising of the big financiers and we have the uprising of the machines. And that creates a new world of Europe. It creates a new system where people now begin to move away from the country into the big cities. And the big cities begin to be places that are overpopulated. And they don't have toilets. And they don't have a good way of draining. I mean, we, we can live in a big city because we, we have a sewage system. Imagine living in a city that doesn't have a sewage system. It didn't have sewage system. It's very rudimentary. And then the poor people lived in these terrible conditions. And they worked in these terrible factories, and to make a living, now people begin to abandon the farms and live in the country. Now you get these big cities developing, and now you got classes. Now you got the owners and the merchants and the workers, and, and, and it becomes the dog-eat-dog -dog world where the owners have to compete, and they, it, it just becomes a disaster. And all kinds of things that we've read about in the history books of how, how terrible things were. All right? We wanted to get to prosperity through the working of these machines, and the machines kept going strong. Why? Because science kept discovering new things, and they're making more experiments. You've got coal, and you've got steam, and then you've got electricity, and the scientific world is going, we're great, we're Superman, there's no problem we can't solve. The financiers are making money like crazy. The industry has to keep getting bigger and bigger as nations develop a bigger and bigger industry, and the poor man and the poor people are being crushed. And it's in that situation that we have the Industrial Revolution, that now you have these people, Karl Marx is only one of them, who are the socialists. They're trying to come up, what's wrong with our world? Our world is not right. Something's wrong with the world. We have to come up with a solution. So now we are 200, 300 years after, 300 years is really the heat of the action, after the destruction of, uh, of the Catholic order, now we have a disaster. We have social ruins. And in those social ruins, communism is going to come up and say, we've got the answer. And it's going to give people a concrete answer with concrete resu results. All right? So that's, uh, and that's where you get called the Manifesto. It was written in 1848. They say it holds pretty much the essence of communism. And then Das Kapital, Volume 1, which is what came from uh, Karl Marx in 1867, that holds his basic theories about uh, communism and it was called the Bible of Socialism, the Bible of Communism is all here. And um, uh, now today, modern day socialists and, and, and social work, social people, they don't, they, 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 they don't think that Karl Marx's theories are valid anymore. They're not valid anymore. All right? But you see, maybe they're not valid anymore, but there's something that's valid. 
and it's revolution. We've got to destroy. The one thing that's valid in all of these guys, this situation, is the desire to destroy the Catholic faith. The particular methods, the ideas, they're popular for a time and they're not valid and they get changed. But the one thing that stays valid is that desire to destroy the church. It's, it's like the apocalypse. You've got this dragon with seven heads. The heads that only agree with each other. They're, they're, they're crazy. But they all come from one body, and the one body's one idea is to destroy that woman. So there doesn't have to be a lot of unity between the enemies of Christ, except for the fact that they're the enemies of Christ and his church. And so that's what we have. And then, of course, we have Lenin comes to, in 1917, and uh, Lenin uh, got power, uh, and, and uh, he was aided by... It's interesting that Lenin, to get in, just to get in to Russia... Uh, he had to have the help of uh, the American Freemasons, the Freemasons in Belgium, and Freemasons in Germany. They financed him. He had a lot of money from bankers in America. A lot of money. A lot of money from bankers in Brussels. And these, these people helped him get in and financed him continually in his revolution. In, uh, in, uh, but he, he had a different... Uh, now, his difference, the difference of Lenin that made him the man for Russia was that Lenin understood that you just can't... Karl Marx's idea was that, you know, there, there, there's class warfare is inevitable. It's part of the machinery of the world. It's going to happen. Just let it happen. It's going to happen. Although it's, he also admitted there must be some communist people, a sort of an elite, that understood the process and would promote the process. But Lenin said, you've got to have a very special elite to get the thing done. You can't wait for these people. You can't wait for the proletariat to stand up. I want my rights. It's not going to happen. You've got to have a very well-trained and committed elite that's going to make it happen. And that's why all revolutions, they happen by a small group of trained people. The, the working people and the poor people, they're just like a mass, a, a mass to be moved by a good speaker. They're just, they're just an excuse. Uh, these guys are the men that are going to make it happen. So that, that is where uh, communism came from, all right? And the popes have said it frequently. It builds upon the disaster, or it builds upon, uh, it builds upon the ruins of liberalism. Uh, liberalism created a world that did not work, and communism builds on that world, all right? Okay, so um, that's the idea. Now, now let's look at the core errors of communism. Okay, what are the core errors of communism, as, it is laid, as, as explained by the Pope? When I give you this, uh, Jeff will copy this, you'll have this uh, outline of Divini, uh, Divini Redentoris Homin, Divini Redentoris. So you have an outline, paragraph numbers, and uh, then you have the basic brief idea of what's in the paragraph. And so these core errors are, not every single one of them, but most of them are listed right here in what is called Communist Doctrine, paragraphs 8 to 24. And then he, you have, a, what it is, you have a, the theory of communism, you have this method and power, and the results, and finally what will, what will happen to it. All right. Now, so the first thing about communism is, and it's, the popes have picked this out, they, they said it's a false mysticism. It gives a false messianic idea. There's salvation. It's really to put a redeemer against the redeemer. All right. um, for communists, religion is the opium of the people. Lenin said that. Uh, it's the enemy because it, 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 it basically keeps people submissive to their problems. and They, they're not, they won't rise up with religion. They're going to rise up against their bosses. So religion is the ultimate enemy of class of this future state of things. So, the false messianic dream to find paradise on earth through the equal sharing of material things in a classless society. So, it's a messianic mysticism. We're going to make the world, we're going to build paradise on earth. All right. um, you find, you know, most, I guess, I don't know, I have not, it's one of my goals. You know, I really would love to get into a communist camp in the MPA Hills, you know. And, and, but I've been told they read the Red Book. Of, they read the Red Book. They read the Red Book of Mao Zedong. The first lines in the Red Book of Mao Zedong are these. If you're going to have a revolution, you have to have a revolutionary party. 
That party is communism. I mean, that's a striking phrase. We need a revolution. And you just go to the people and tell them, the problem that you have, you know what that problem is? Is you are poor. The problem is him and him and that and that. That's the problem. And we're going to take them out. And all your problems are solved. Your problem is always somebody else's problem. It's from the world around you. It's not from you or any. It's the world around you is the problem. And we, we're going to change that world. Are you with me? Yes! Get a gun. We're ready to go. So it's very, it's a mysticism. You know, it's, it's a plan. It's a, it's a, it's a good idea. It, you know, somebody has nothing to do, is unemployed. It's a heck of a lot better. This is a lot better than just standing around playing basketball and smoking cigarettes. This is something to do. So it's a false messianic vision uh, based on a materialistic view of the world. It's horrible. Man is nothing but a lump of ma a ma matter. People are just social matter. That's what people were for Karl Marx. Social matter. That gets moved by economic events. They could not see there's something beyond. They refused. Absolute refusal to see something beyond the matter. Matter is everything. Now, when you're suffering from hunger, you can believe that. Because the first thing you have to do is have a full belly before you can start thinking about stuff. And if you don't have a full belly, you can't think. And so this works for these kind of situations. Okay? So the first thing is this false messianic dream that, that can inspire people. Almost all of the communists who have converted in the past century have said, those are the good old days. We would get up at four in the morning and study our books. We would go to bed at midnight. We would work. We would labor. We'd sacrifice for a cause. And we we, we get back to church and there's no cause. I had three ladies on retreat here about nine years, eight years ago. One of them told me that. She said, you know, we live in the mountains. We just ate bananas. Many sacrifices here. I don't, GKK, no sacrifices, nothing to do. There's no... There's nothing, there's no plan, there's no action, there's nothing, it's just a blasé, it's just boring. Yeah. People want sacrifice. People want a plan. They want a goal. And it's easy to give them a false goal. A false plan, a materialistic one. It takes a lot more to give them a spiritual plan. That's more difficult. It requires a lot more. The second problem is this dialectic historical materialism. All right. Dialectic historical materialism. Uh, Kant, uh, Karl Marx had studied Hegel, and so Hegel is some kind of thesis and antithesis. A thesis hits society, and then the antithesis hits it, and it changes society, and then there's a, that, that thesis becomes the antithesis, and it just goes over and over again. Society evolves in this sort of binary way. So we apply that to economics and to the economic situation. Right. All right. All right. All right. Of course, everything in the world is materialistic. So the basic idea here is the world is essentially just a lump of matter. Uh, I think it was uh, the Pope says that Karl Marx said that um, the the brain is nothing more than the most refined part of matter. Your thinking is just a very, very refined portion of matter. And Lenin said the same thing. The brain, the soul, is just refined matter. All right. The third error is that there is no God. <clears throat> you see pictures of the communists uh, in the early days of communism. Uh, the communist Bolsheviks, they're climbing a ladder, and they get up to where there's heaven, they open the door, and they don't find anybody up there. Uh, there's a famous uh, communist uh, a cosmonaut who was in a, some kind of, he was circling the earth, and he said, guess what, guys, I don't see God. No God. Now, here I am in heaven. No God. So they're anti-God. And they teach atheism. Uh, you know. So that's communist, right? And religion is an enemy of the poor people. Right? Uh, they affirm that man has no fourth error. They affirm that man has no free will. He's just social matter. He's, he's being moved by inexorable economic uh, processes. So the priest... He has to teach people the faith because he's moved by a desire to save his own skin and to make a living. The king has to do what he does because he wants to save his own prestige. The poor people do what they got to do because they got to survive. And everybody's just acting under almost evolutionary forces, doing what they do 
as determined by the circumstances of their life. The circumstances of a man's life completely determine him. He's not really free to do anything. All right. All right. Um, all right. The next error is that as a result of this, man has no real, there no, there's no real uh, moral code. Moral code is economics. What's profitable. Might makes right. Uh, what's profitable is what is just. What is beneficial to you is what is good. There's no moral code. Marriage is more, nothing more than an economic institution. And the education of children belongs to the state. Right? It's the state's primary responsibility to educate your children. It's not the parents. Parents don't have any special prime obligations over the children. You know, and they, they were even efforts in communist Russia to have common wives and a common place to take care of children. It never worked. It was totally impossible. But they had the idea. They even tried it. I don't know if they tried it, but they had the idea and brought, brought this idea forward. It didn't work with the people. All right. <clears throat> All right. Everyone is equal. The only differences that are in society are based on, uh, the only differences in society are really based on uh, econ economic reasons, economic motives. All right. All right. Um, what is the state and the communist thing? The state will disappear. In the future world, there will be no state or government. The state or government is nothing more than uh, a means of fostering class warfare until we get to the classless society, and then the state will disappear. On the contrary, in capitalism, the state is the oppressor. The state becomes the oppressor with all the rich people. All right. um, and then it's an interesting paragraph in which the Pope explains uh, several paragraphs. Why communism appeals to men. All right. All right. Well, why com well, firstly, it gives an interesting paragraph on this. It uses subversive methods. In general, the first thing that communism does, it hides its true purpose. It hides its true aim under, the, under, under, under a certain advertisement. I'm working for the poor people. It always says, working for the poor classes. But the actual goal is to revolt, is to create a revolt, to turn things upside down. That's the actual goal. But it begins by saying, we're working for the people. Father Daniels gave us a conference about four years ago on uh, communism taking over about 24 different European countries. And in every country, it started in the same way. How did it start? We are only promoting religious liberty. They were Catholic countries. So it began by saying we promote religious liberty. That weakened the government not to fight against something anti-Catholic. Then they got in their anti-Catholic, they set up their groups, and then they overthrew the government. But they got in by saying religious liberty. And they ended up with no religious liberty and atheistic communism in charge of about 24 different countries. So they hide their true aim. And they come out with an aim that's going to be a pleasing to us. Uh, the poor people. Uh, in uh, Re Reveille for a Rebel, I think it's called the book, a certain communist uh, who had a great influence on Barack Obama wrote a book on how to be a communist. He said how they did it in Chicago. They would go in, they, would, they knew the main enemy of their, their work, their main guy that would be against them would be the Catholic priest. So, and he's the main guy that has power over the working man. So they would go to the Catholic priest and say, Father, how are you? Yeah. Wow, that gym over your school is kind of busted, that roof, isn't it? Yeah. What do you need here, Father? Well, we need it. Yeah, yeah, we need a new roof on our gym, you know. We don't have any money. What can I help you with that? And then what else do you need? New roof on the church. This boiler's broken in the basement. And they would go in and help the priest. And once they helped the priest, they would neutralize any criticism against their communist groups. They weren't called communists from study sets. And then they would subversive activity right in the parish with the parish men. First thing, get the priest on your side. So they hide the true aim, whatever aim they can come up with. And then the second thing they do is they exploit the existing injustices. You just go somewhere and you look at the injustices. So you see a kid and he's a person, and you're not, are you getting paid? Are they giving you insurance in your work? No, no insurance. No insurance? Man, that's terrible. No insurance? Look at your situation. And they would just find out, and they would exas exasperate the problem and create Hey, he hates his employer, employers, and make a warfare between these two. Okay, sister, buddy, mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So they make a warfare between these two situations. Make a big problem. 
So you, you exacerbate the various problems and difficulties there are between people. All right? and, uh, and, there's, and you know, if you go anywhere in the world, you can find problems. Just come to our parish. In our parish, look at the problems. Well, I see problems here. And there's problems, you know. These people don't care about the church. It's an Amicon building out here. And then, look at that. I mean, people might slide and break their neck on the road. And then there, there, there is no care for people around here at all. They don't care, these people. Unbelievable. And so you come here. Look at that. Look at There's a garbage can right over there in the parish hall. That's, that is that's sanitary problem. And you just exaggerate all the problems. Before you know, oh, everybody's scandalized. Oh, you're right. You're right. And you can create a whole problem in one minute. Just one revolutionary could create problems in no time. All you got to do is come in, look at all the problems, advertise them, exaggerate them, and you could create a big problem. You see? So they look at that and they do that, you see. All right? And then the, the third thing they do is, uh, it's very, uh, that thing is, they take advantage of the fact that there's no coherency in the liberal economic machine to solve any of the problems. There's no group. There's not, the church, the, nobody doing anything about these problems anyway, so they take advantage of that. And then, finally, they use pseudo-scientific arguments. It's like during COVID. It's the best the science says. The science says. Everybody believes the science. You can't say no to science. Who can say no to science? But it's not always true science. Pseudo-science. Yeah. So then you got a problem. And so that's the way it works. Now, Communism appeals, the Pope, that's a, the, another area that communism appeals to men, why? Because of the vacuum of Christian substance. The world is empty of real Christian practice. It's not there. Empty of true Christian practice. And especially ignorance of Catholic social doctrine. With that, um, communism is going to make a, make a big hit. Secondly, the destruction of religious practices. Uh, you know, that's one of the things the Industrial Revolution did. You can't go to church on Sunday. Another thing it did that was very detrimental in Europe is the fact that when you create these new cities, they happened overnight uh, very quickly, and you have these industrial areas, and there are no churches in that area. And the workers are there, and they can't get to church. And there are no churches in that area. Um, so this created a problem. Men couldn't go to church. They couldn't get to church. And uh, therefore, they destroyed religious practice. All right, and uh, that was a problem. All right, and destruction of religious practices. The third thing to be very familiar with is a diabolic propaganda machine. Incredible propaganda machine, uh, with unlimited resources, gigantic organizations, one organizing center, the whole range of media touching all the classes of people. Sound familiar? Look at what happened during COVID, you know, you've got the, the media screening out, all the social, screening out any dissident voices. Well, is that coming from Moscow? I don't know. But you know, the, 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 the game plan for fighting COVID throughout the whole world was the same everywhere on earth. Now, that means there's a unified policy. That might be my, I don't know Moscow, who it is. But there's a unified policy. All right, all right, okay. So, uh, the diabolic propaganda is under the resources. And another problem is, the fourth problem is, and this is another incredible thing, is the conspiracy of silence of the anti-Catholic press. In other words, people in the world never learned about 30, 40, 50 million people being murdered in communist Russia. There was times when they went, they were, the people were starved to death. The government starved people to death. There were, sit, there were, there were, there were stock uh, barns full of grain that were guarded by soldiers, locked up, people could not get. They were going to the cemetery, laying down on the graves of their ancestors and dying. They went through a purge campaign of any, uh, purging people that were the, the teachers of schools and universities and people that could be an obstacle to the regime in the 1922, 23, they killed them. They just killed these people. Uh, the same is true, the Pope says, is, uh, Spain. The, the murders and the, the atrocities, the murders of bishops, priests, and religious in Spain, in Mexico. So the world doesn't hear about that. We never heard about that in America. The anti-Catholic press doesn't relate any of that. 
During the Ukraine war, we don't hear about the genocide happening in Africa or other places like that. We don't hear about the Ukraine war. We, don't, we hear about what they want us to hear about. We don't hear about what they don't want us to hear about. But there's people being murdered by Muslim insurrectionists every day. Right? But we don't hear about that. Right? Okay. Because that's not part of the game plan. So that's, see, that's not known. There are lots of other wars going on in the world for reasons that are not good. But we don't know about that because the media doesn't say anything about it. Right? So that's a silent. And then, of course, we can add another reason the Pope doesn't say. And that's it today that we live in a day, a world today, where there is no Catholic press. Outside of maybe life site news, Catholic family news. There's a little bit of Catholic press, but not much. Right? This doesn't exist. Right? And then finally, the fruits of communism are barbarities, terrible barbarities, terrible tortures that have been inflicted upon people that are worse than the barbarians ever inflicted. Okay. okay. We still have seven minutes to go for one hour. All right. Um, what does... So that's the core errors of communism. So you'll have a copy of that. Where does communism lead? Okay. Well, the Pope says communism leads to its own failure because false dreams always fail. What happened in 1991? Soviet Union dissolved. Well, that was, of course, strictly an economic situation. But economically, the thing didn't really work then. Right? So, right? All right. Just so, uh, error in principles cannot produce good fruits. All right? Besides the fact that all of the promises that Christ gave to his church, or the angel Gabriel gave to Christ, his kingdom there should be no end. The gates of hell should not prevail against it. So the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The Christendom will not prevail against it. So it will last forever. The contrary is also true. The enemy, the kingdoms that are raised up against it will not last at all. They will not last. So the Pope say they're just going to bring about universal ruin. Communism will simply bring about universal ruin. All right. Now, what is the church's answer? Okay. What is the church's answer to communism? All right. Here we just be very brief because we're running out of time. But the church's answer to communism lies in renewing private and public life by applying the age-old evangelical principles to the conditions of our times and places. You mean you take the old principles that, that are known, Catholic social teaching, the principles of the gospel, and we have to apply them in new situations. It's not uh, a cookie cutter. It's to know what the principles are. And Pope St. Pius X said this requires a very good education. He didn't want people getting involved in politics or doing anything like that unless they were very well trained. Because it's complicated. It's not easy to sort out all of these errors, to know what the truth is and how to apply it, and to apply it. So we have to know the social teaching of the church. What are the principles of the gospel that apply to modern to the world and apply it in these circumstances? This requires an analysis of the problem that is accurate and just, a knowledge of the principles that is sound, and the application which is persevering and courageous. That's not easy. That's what's required. All right? That's what the church wants to do. All right? Now, the question is, what are these most essential evangelical principles that must be applied? All right? Well, he gives about five. He talks about two that are the most important. But there's a long list because this, this encyclical is 83 or so and six pages long, I mean, uh, paragraphs long, and so the remedies run from paragraph 40 to paragraph 83. So it's a lot of information there, all right? Um, so, well, number one, the number one thing is detachment from earthly goods. The number one principle, the number one social principle of the gospel is blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs, the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the earth. Number one, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you want to have a prosperous society, you have to forget about it. You have to try to get the cabin. Because the way society is built, according to the conception of the popes, according to what you'll read in the, the Catholic doctrine, is like this.
That's how society is built. And if we don't work with these arrows, we cannot build Christian society. Impossible. Now, communism is built this way. Materialism, 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 to equal sharing of mud. Equal sharing of material. You know, that doesn't sound bad when you're hungry. But when you understand that everything material is only a basis for the spiritual, it's perverse. It's kalibanga. It's very bad. And so, you see, it's only when men no longer have a grip on their faith that communism can make any sense. It's built on atheism. It's built on materialism. All right? And so, the first thing is detachment from earthly goods. Now, the, here the church says some very wise things. The church teaches the poor that you, too, have obligations of justice. Communism teaches the poor that you are a victim. You are a poor victim, you have nothing to do but revolt. Which only makes the victim's situation worse. Unless he becomes an owner. <laughs> unless he can be in charge of a bunch of other victims and then he can have a better situation. Unless he can be exactly what he's fighting against. It's a terrible contradiction. But um, you have obligations of justice. That misery and hardship are common to every single human being on the earth. And that they must hold spiritual goods in much higher esteem than material ones. And you know, it's the only way that poor people can progress at all, is if they hold them. The spiritual is higher than the material. And by going for that spiritual, their material will progress. Yeah. Always does. Yeah. Not to becoming rich, but becoming a better situation. Right? Number two... The precept of charity in real fulfillment. Not in giving out bags of rice and stuff like that. Real fulfillment in following the wise social teaching of the Catholic Church. Practice especially in the spiritual and corporal works of mercy. But for this to become a reality, men must live more moderately. Pope says men have to live more moderately in order to make sacrifices precisely in order to help those people who are more unfortunate. People live moderately to help those who are living more unfortunate. Okay. Those are the two main ideas. The others are important also. That is saying the church, charity requires justice. Justice requires, and I'll conclude with this, justice requires understanding the situation. Understanding the relationships. Understanding social teaching. Understanding requires study. And only from sound doctrine can sound social work flow. It is the ignorance of Catholics, of Catholic social teaching, that led to their failure to implement it that paved the way for communism. Hamas Frazier was a communist. Hamas Frazier was fighting with the communists in Spain against Franco. He became a Catholic. He's the only man that had a dove stand on his head, okay? He gave a conference about Fatima, and one of the doves from the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary came over and landed on his head. He stayed there for about ten minutes. And Hamish Framer, Frazier, see, he, ran a, he ran, a, ran a newspaper called a Propo. When I was a little boy, it was my pastor read it when I was a little boy. And uh, he, um, he was a traditional Catholic. And Hamish Frazier said it's because Catholics did not practice Catholic social teaching that communism succeeded. If Catholics had practiced Catholic social teaching, communism could never have succeeded. Right. That's our job in the MI Brotherhood. That, remember, our job in the MI Brotherhood is fivefold. And number one, we have Catholic apologetics to defend Our Lady. Number two, we have to have Catholic social doctrine to spread that in society. Uh, number three, it means to help to, to uh, train the youth. Right? Train the youth. Number four, it means to help the family. Number five, help the church. Right? Build it. Raise money for it fix it, and run processions. Those are the five domains of the MI Brotherhood. Okay? You know, Catholic, uh, defend Our Lady, honor of Our Lady by Catholic apologetics. Spread Catholic social teaching throughout its social strata. 
um, train the youth, especially young men. Help the family. Help the Catholic family. And fifthly, you know, help the church. So, <clears throat> then that's the idea. So I'll give this to you. You can, uh, and next time we have a meeting will be after, probably back in June or something like that. And then, uh, well, take this as just a brief, this is a summary of the first 30 paragraphs. All right. And uh, so Jeff will make copies of this for you. All right. And then uh, the next time we have a talk on, on this, we'll go more into detail the Catholic doctrine opposed to communism. Uh, from the encyclical, and uh, and so on. Meanwhile, uh, I'll have a, you know, we'll have a couple of guys in Butuan, our men in Butuan, they will do a talk on the, they will try to prepare a little uh, video talk on, with a study paper that I'll overview on this, the history of communism in the Philippines from the hooks to the CPP to the MPA and the involvement of the government in those things a little bit, the history of communism here in the Philippines. Right. That'll be at least a, a, a an offering, and then, and we'll go from there. Okay. All right. That, that's about it. So, we'll say a prayer. Then after that prayer, then we can have questions or uh, action items. All right. Say a prayer. We part it. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O Maria, give an amkon to Allah. Shala, kambo mo kami na mino kani mo. Gangkanan ng wala minang opkanimo, labi na mga maso ni mga kuyangkanimo. O Maria, gipanam ko na wala isla, ngamba mo kami na minang opkanimo. Gangkanan ng wala minang opkanimo, labi na mga maso ni mga kuyangkanimo. O Maria, gipanam ko na wala isla, ngamba mo kami na minang opkanimo. Gangkanan ng wala minang opkanimo, labi na mga maso ni mga kuyangkanimo. Amen. Alang sa mga dugang videos and informations, just click like, subscribe, then click the notification bell for more updates.